Thanks a lot, Sami. Thanks a lot, Samira. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all are doing great. So today we are going to talk about kidney pathology, basic kidney pathology for nephrology fellows. Some of you have just joined on 1st July and some of you have transitioned to second year. We talk a lot about diseases which involves the kidney, but before we understand the diseases, it is very really important to understand how a normal kidney looks like. What is the morphology of a normal kidney? And why a kidney pathologist ends up doing so many stains because there are a bunch of stains which we do, a bunch of testing which we do to come up with a diagnosis. So, but before we go into details, it's very important to understand what is the basic kidney morphology. So we'll start with that, okay? So you all can see my screen. So when we start reading a kidney pathology, we start with a microscope. We put the slide on a microscope and then we look at the slide. And this is the low power. So when you look at the slide on the low power, you screen whether the kidney is present or not. That is the first thing I will see when I put my slide on to the microscope. So how can do I know this is a what, what, Shri, can you tell us what the low power means? Like what is the magnification? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. So depending on the microscope, there are different objectives which we will use, right? So low power generally is 4x, but few people end up starting at 2x. Like in my microscope, I have a 2x also. So this is the lowest power for me. And then I will start going on high, uh, high power. So this is 4x, still very low. And you can see the field of view. So low power, which we use is for identifying the basic architecture of the kidney. First of all, as soon as I put my slide under the microscope, I will confirm whether I am in the kidney or not. Am I seeing the kidney or not? So how do I identify as a fellow who has just joined a fellowship that this is the kidney? This round structures, which we can see in the low power, which are like soccer balls, these are known as glomerulus. And in the background, there are a ton of tube-like structures. Shree, can you, can you turn the uh, brightness down a little bit? There are some comments that the screen so, is yes. a bit too bright. Yeah, so it will go down the brightness as I move to the high power. So that is the uh, display thing. So as I will stay in the low power, more light is going to come under the microscope. So the brightness will be a lot. So as I will move towards the higher power, so right now I am at 20x. Right now I have a 10x basically. So the amount of light which is reaching the camera has reduced. So brightness will be reduced. So in this power, you can see the round structures which I was showing you. And you can see a bunch of tubular structures. They can be cut longitudinally or horizontally. Okay, so these round structures are known as glomerulus. If I'm talking about multiple glomerulus, I'm going to use the word glomeruli. Before we start digging deeper into the morphology, it is also important to understand the stains. Stains are basically dyes which we use to color the tissue because when you do a biopsy, it is colorless. When we cut those histological sections, also they are colorless. To appreciate the morphology or to understand a disease or to understand what is going on with that biopsy, you have to put some dyes to it or some staining material to that particular tissue. And that particular staining material is going to bring up different aspects of that tissue. That is what we call staining. So in this particular case, which I'm showing right now, this particular stain is known as hematoxylin and eosin stain or H and E stain. This is a basic stain. When I will do this stain, I can appreciate the basic morphology of the kidney. Like in the low power, I decided I am in the cortex, I am looking at the kidney. Then as I moved onto the higher powers, I identified I'm looking at the glomeruli and I have tubules in the background and that's it. I also have blood vessels. If I say this is normal, why are you going to believe me, right? You don't have to believe me this is normal. The point I want to make to say something as normal, we have to I understand what normal is. So that is what we are going to do. So in this glomerulus, I'm saying this is normal in morphology. Okay. So I will go on high power on one of the glomerulus. Okay. And what is the high power magnification? So now that I just went to? to 20x. So on a 20x, this is a higher power, higher than the 10x, and this is the 40x, Samira. 
So on a 40X, you can really see a glomerulus and that occupies almost your entire field right now. And this is 20X. So depending on what you are looking, you will play with the magnification of the microscope and depending on the magnification which you use, different areas you can see. Right at this magnification, I can appreciate many things in this glomerular morphology, but a fellow is just starting. That person is going to struggle. And I can understand that because I know from my initial days in pathology, if you give me a lot of stuff to see in a particular field, I will be lost because as a starter, I don't know, shall I focus here? Shall I focus here? Shall I focus here, here? So I don't know what is important in this field. So I will end up focusing almost everywhere. So as you train yourself, we also develop um, our acumen of focusing on the specific areas. So that's why when you rotate in your pathology rotation or with your senior colleagues, you will see they end up moving from low power to high power very fast. And you are kind of lost, hey, what's happening? Basically that person's experience tells that person where the disease lies. As soon as they put the slide under the microscope, they screen that slide and they under, under a, uh, like very soon they will identify what are the areas I should focus on and they go immediately on that field. So in this one, I am at 20X, I can identify this glomerulus and I'm saying this is normal in morphology. So why I am saying that? Before I move on to that aspect, I have to understand different compartments of a glomerulus, right? Because only then I can understand. So this was the glomerulus. And now I'm saying it has different parts also, okay? This pink- uh, Shri, I have a question on that. Sure. I noticed um, you went for a glomerulus that's just about falling off yeah. uh, on the edge. Uh, yeah. Do you recommend not doing that and finding- Yeah, ideally you- In the middle yeah. because I'm cutting it. Can you comment I, on that? I agree. So, but you have to interpret everything, Matt. You're right. So ideally it should be a good glomerulus in the center of the biopsy with no edge artifacts. But in a particular biopsy, you don't have a choice. You will end up seeing whatever you get basically. So you have to interpret every gland. So morphology wise, I can interpret even this gland, okay? So in this one, this pink areas are mesangium. The glomerular tuft is made of a bunch of capillary tufts. So what will happen? An afferent arterial is going to come from this side. I don't see that afferent arterial here. So let me focus a gland which can show that. So I am moving a little fast right now. It will be might a little dizzy for you, but I'm trying to focus a gland and I am not able to focus a gland. We will screen other stains where I will be able to find both afferent as well as efferent arterioles. But this is a glam in the center. So we can go over the basic morphology on this one. So in this glam, as the blood vessels will enter, they will branch out into the capillaries. And mesangium is kind of a skeleton which will hold the capillaries together. So this pink area, which you see in between is the mesangium matrix. The nuclei or the brew round thing which you are seeing are the mesangial nuclei. Pink is matrix. Blue is nuclei. And those round things are capillary loops. Blood vessel will divide eventually into smaller structure. The smallest structure it ends up dividing into is known as capillary loops. So glomerulus is just a tuft which is comprised of multiple or a tuft of capillaries, small capillaries. The pink areas in between the capillary loops is known as mesangial matrix. The blue things in between the matrix or within the matrix are the mesangial cells. Over here, I can see the loops which are open. By that, I mean, I don't see anything within that lumen. I don't see anything outside the capillary loop. This space, which is outside the capillary loop is known as the Bowman's space. I don't see anything over here. It is completely empty. I can see some nuclei which are present outside the tuft. Like here, I can appreciate one. I can appreciate one over here. This is the flat dark blue nuclei. So when you see a nuclei outside the glomerular tuft, just hugging the glomerular tuft from outside, we call that as a podocyte or a visceral epithelial cell. The nuclei which are lining the other aspect of the Bowman's space are known as parietal epithelial cells. And this is also known as Bowman's capsule. 
And as I will start going out of the glomerulus, I will start focusing on the round or tubular things outside. The sphinct things are known as proximal tubules. So how do I know they are proximal tubules? How they are different from the other tubules in the background? Proximal tubules have pink cytoplasm, which is granular. So this is pink. And the granularity is the coarseness of the cytoplasm, the small pink pink. That's why we call this as a granular. And this blue stuff is known as nuclei. So whenever you end up seeing tubules, which are showing you a lot of pink cytoplasm, you will know that is a proximal tubule. When you end up seeing tubules, which doesn't have that much of cytoplasm, have a flattened kind of a look, that is distal tubule. The areas in between the tubules is known as interstitium. I know there are a lot of new words coming on. So what will happen as I will move to the different stains, I will go over those names again. So the names hey, are uh, going to get- Street. Yes. You see that um, tubule that's right next to the glom? Yeah. Is that the macula densa? Yes, that is the macula densa. I don't see the JG apparatus over here very well. I will try to cut off from the JG. It's super yes, important. yeah. This is a macula densa. What Matt is mentioning, and there should be a JG apparatus. So what is happening? Glomeruli or the glomerulus is a three-dimensional structure. So depending at what level you are cutting that particular tissue, you are going to see different structures. So this location, what Matt identified is a location for JG apparatus. This is macula densa. And we will try to see other components of JG apparatus if we can focus a gland, which was cut at that particular level. And would I don't see- Would you say the macula densa is the most important part of the nephron? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and you love that, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Just wanted to verify that. Yes, no, I agree with you. <laughs> so that is, this is the hematoxin and eosin stain, but each stain has its own limitations. By that, I mean, you can identify finite number of things on a particular stain, but if you want to go deeper or if you want to learn more stuff, you have to use other stains. So in this photomicrograph, this is a hematoxin and eosin stain. I'm saying this image is also normal. So what do I mean by that? I can see a glomerulus over here. I can see the tubules, which are back to back. I can see a blood vessel, which looks normal. And why do I say that blood vessel looks normal? And I will show you different stains. So for each stain, the normalcy is limited, right? What you can appreciate. So in this one, I can see a blood vessel wall and I don't see anything else. I don't see any increased cellularity. I don't see disruption in the wall. That's why I'm calling that as a normal. And we will appreciate different stains. In HNE, &E, I'm not appreciating any other cells in between the tubules. The tubules are very back to back, okay? So that's why I'm calling this as a normal. The um, tubule- Three, I have another question. Those yeah. vessels look like a pretty thick wall. Do you, mm -hmm. Is that just me or wh why do I feel like that? Yeah, so depending on which vessel you have cut, the thickness will be highly variable from wall to wall, right? From the blood vessel to blood vessel. So this will be a normal thick, uh, thickness of the blood vessel. This is not thickened. But as I will show you different stains, you will see, you will be able to appreciate the thickness better. Because in the HNE &E stain, what you are appreciating basically is architecture and cellularity. That's it. I'm not appreciating the details. So to do that, like that, more on the cellularity and the exact morphology, I have to go on a different stain. And that stain is known as PAS, or periodic and skip stain, okay? So this is the PAS stain, and this is the same field which I was looking at HNE, &E, Matt. And you can see the blood vessel. This looks pretty benign and normal. The endothelial cells are just sitting on top of the intima. This is the muscularis layer, and it is not thickened. The endothelial cell is just sitting on the intima. There is no difference, there is no gap. If it was a fibrosis, you would have seen something else, like you would have seen a fibrous tissue in between. Sure, yeah. just, we've gotten a couple of questions in the chat about how can you differentiate between a tubule and a blood vessel? Yeah, I'll go with that, okay. <clears throat> so let me go on a high power. So initially, both are looking like tubes, right? So I will go on high power and I will differentiate. So as I'm training my eyes to identify kidney morphology, 
this thing, this thing, and this thing are all tubes, right? Which will look alike to me. Then I will dig deeper. Why this tube is different from this tube and this tube, okay? This is the outline of this particular tube and it is branching out over here. Then I will go deeper to the next layer. As soon as I define an outline of a tube, I will start going inside. The next layer in that particular tube is muscle. This pink thing is very solidified thing. And I'm telling you, this is a muscle, okay? So this is a muscle. So keep that image in your mind and keep that image in your mind and put this image over here. This thing or this tubular structure is totally different from this one. Why it is different? Because inside this outline, there are epithelial cells. This round structure, which appears to be continuous, are actually made up of multiple individual cells. You cannot see the outline because the cell membrane is like a kind of merged together, but they are like epithelial cells and they have a different morphology than on this one. So these are also cells, but they are muscular cells and they are kind of interdigitating to each other. You cannot identify the difference and they are forming like a solid tube. In this one, they are epithelial cells and they have ton of pink cytoplasm. And this is a PA stain. That's why you can appreciate the brush border also. So this pink, so if I am focusing just right here, this shade of pink is a lighter pink. And as I'm going outside towards the lumen, the shade of pink increases. This becomes the brush border. That's why this is the other marker which tells you you are within a proximal tubule. If you compare this tubular structure with this one, this is a totally different structure. I cannot see the ample pink cytoplasm which I was seeing here. I cannot see the solidified layer which I was seeing here. And I cannot see the brush border I was seeing here. That's why this is a distal tubule, okay? Coming back out, this is the another tubular structure which I can see in between, the different tubes. So this was the blood vessel which we identify. This is the distal tubule which we identify. This is the proximal tubule. This round structure has practically no wall. I cannot appreciate. All the other tubes had a thick wall. This almost is like a thin wall, but you can see a few dark nuclei. So I'm sure this is lined by something. This tubular structure is lined by something because I can see the cell nuclei. These are the peritubular capillaries. Similar capillaries, what you saw on the glands, these are also a capillary which are present within the interstitium and these are known as peritubular capillaries, okay? So that is what will happen. You will identify the morphology on a lower part, like a big picture, and then you will start digging deeper and dissecting out, and then you will go at the cellular morphology. What I will say to a nephrology fellow when they start, it is not like just to understand a disease, they might, not, they might not have a necessity to understand each and every cell morphology in detail, okay? They should understand the architecture broadly in a very broad sense, the diseases which are affecting that architecture, understanding what a normal mix means, and then understanding what an abnormal means from a high power view. If they are comfortable, they understood that morphology. If they are interested, they can go more and more deep. So is there any question in this field right now? Thank you, that, that was great. Was yeah, that was, that was great. Um, and just to, to go back a little bit to the basics, can you share with us how you tell the difference between h &E and TAS stain and how you know you're looking at one or the other? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so what I will do, before I move, I will just in this field, I have already have a glomerulus. So I will finish that and in the low power, I'll show you the difference. I can say this is a PAS stain because this pink, which much more pinker or brighter pink than the h &E stain, which I showed. Like I went over the glomerular morphology in the last stain and that was h &E. This is a PAS stain. You can see the matrix. If you remember from the last case, this matrix is much more pink. You can identify the nuclei much more clearly. So you have to identify the number of nuclei which are present within a single area. Only then you can say this is normal. So if I am counting with you, I can see one nuclei here, maybe two, that's it. When I'm moving in this mesangial area, I can again see two nuclei. In this mesangial area, I'm seeing only one. So normal is three or less. If you end up seeing four or more, that is abnormal, 
okay? And you, your section thickness is very important. When I say three or less, I mean three micron thick sections. If you end up increasing the section thickness of the tissue, the number of nuclei are going to increase, okay? And we went over the normal glam and the h &E. I said normal because the capillary loop is open. The Bowman's space looks normal. There are parietal epithelial cells and there are visceral epithelial cells. I don't see any abnormality. I don't see any more cells. That's why this is normal. When I looked at the cytoplasm, I was able to appreciate the brush border. That's why this is a PS stain. If it was an HNE &E stain, I couldn't have appreciated the brush border so nicely. The cytoplasm is much more granular. I told you about the granular cytoplasm in the last slide, which was HNE, &E, and it was very difficult to understand what do you mean by granular? But when I come to the PS stain, the granularity is very obvious. Can you see those small, pink round dots, almost like sand, fine sand particles, which are there. They're protein resorption droplets. That's a granular cytoplasm, okay? So that's why this is a PS stain. So I went over high power view of a PS stain and told you how will you identify this is a PS stain. Brush border, much more pink mesangial matrix. The basement membranes are very obvious. You can see the definition of tubules, like the boundary. You can see the boundary of the glom. That's why this is a PS stain. Remember this field. I will show you the same field on an HNE &E stain and you will be able to see the difference. Sure, can you uh, stay on the PS just for one second? Um, several people asked the same question about how do you define the mesangial space and, you know, and how do you kind of tell whether you're in the capillary loop or not? Got it, got it, got it. <clears throat> so that is a good question. So how do you define a mesangium space, basically? So mesangial space is kind of a continuous space in between the different capillary loops. And like it will spread throughout the glam, right? Because it is a three-dimensional thing. What you are counting is a two-dimensional thing. So generally the area in between the three capillary loops, like this is one capillary loop, two capillary loop, three capillary loops. This area is the mesangial matrix. So when I count the cellularity, I will count this space. I'm not going to include this space. This is a different mesangial matrix, but this is a different space. I'm going to count this space separately, this one. Because if you count the overall number of the nuclei, there will be a lot and you cannot focus that. So when you count a mesangial hypercellularity, you select an area an area is an area in between three capillaries, and that is how you count. And you have to stay away from the hilar area. So this is the hilum. This is the blood vessel wall. This is the hilar area. You, uh, you should not count the mesangial matrix cellularity in this area. So you count hypercellularity away from the hilar area, cool. and it should be That's three or less. Um, the hilar area, I huh? always sort of assumed it was closer to the wall. That's sort of like right in the middle. Like, can you? This is right in the middle. So what you did, you ended up uh, cutting this glom from the top. So when you see a picture, you always assume the hilum is going to be here, like the blood vessel. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. It's like I, I yeah. would think it's in the right in the middle. Yeah. So what happens? Just imagine the ball cutting from the top, rather than so you are imagining a glom cutting like always from the hilum in the middle. But it is possible you will might end up cutting a glom from the top, right? Oh, okay. So, yeah, so this is the top view. So you ended up cutting that glom from the very top and you can see the hilum here. So when a pathologist is looking at each glom, yes, we do look at their mind of... is what orientation it is on how it's cut. Yes. Because you see, can tell you that's the hilum because the mesangials, uh, those nuclei are all in one little area. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> is that is that what is that I'm asking? Is that is that how you can tell? Because this is a continuous it, structure. So I, I think this is the blood vessel wall which is going, and I can confirm my finding by going into the other levels and seeing that arterial wall. I can follow that up, you know. But gradually you are trained to pick up different areas when you see a glam. Let me see if I can trace that glam at a different level. <clears throat> no, that glam is gone that particular you cannot see that so it is possible am i going towards the hilum or away from the hilum if i'm going away from the hilum i might not be able to see that so you just find in different cuts so let's see this one so this is the hne next hne can you see that arterial or kind kind of look in this one this area so 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I can see that now. Yeah. So that's why it was a high level. So if I pick, I don't have the other sections. If I end up picking oh, sections cool. consecutively. Okay. So you bring up a great question, man. So when we analyze a kidney tissue, we analyze multiple sections because as you said, I can see a particular morphology on a particular level, but it might not be seen very nicely. So to do that and to appreciate that three-dimensional structure, I have to cut multiple levels. So classically, easily on a particular case, we end up seeing 15 to 30 levels on a particular slide. So we see that particular glob on different levels to make sure I'm not missing anything because it is a three-dimensional ball, right? If I cut on the top, I will miss what's going on in the middle. So I'm going to cut that glom at a multiple levels to make sure I'm not missing anything. And as a pathologist, you analyze all the gloms and that is where the concept of focal and diffuse pops up. So let me pick up a different stain and explain you that concept. So <clears throat> this is the other stain which I picked up. In the low part itself, you see, this is much more darker. This is all like a black color. This is a silver stain, okay? the black colored stain, this is a silver stain. And I was going over the concept of glands, right? So in this field, you are seeing three glands. If a disease is going to involve 50% or more of the glands, I'm going to call that disease as diffuse. If a disease affects only a particular tuft, I'm going to call that disease as segmental. And by chance, Matt, you can see that gland. Now it is the hilum is much more clean on that one. This is the same gland which we saw on the last one. And let me bring that into focus properly. Can you see that arterial? Is it much more visible right now? In the other levels, it will end up joining here. Matt, can you see that yeah, arterial? Yeah, that, 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 yeah. yeah, thanks for explaining So, that. And this is the, if I, it involves only a part of the turf, the disease, I'm going to call that as a segmental. And this is one of the best stains to identify the GBM. Because in PAS, you end up seeing the cytoplasmic staining. You end up seeing the cells which were staining for other things. This is the PAS stain and it stains the basement membranes the best, okay? So this is the normal basement membranes. You cannot, like, you cannot make out at every level the basement membranes. So this is the normal thickness. The waviness of the basement membranes is normal. The color of the mesangium is normal. This dark colored mesangium is normal. If there is any abnormality, you will see deviation and gradually we will show you multiple abnormal scenarios, but this picture is normal. So I'm can using you, this. Can you tell us why on the PAS, the mesangium and the basal membranes look pink and why on silver stain they look black? What are they staining for? Yeah, <clears throat> so carbohydrate, right? PAS was staining for carbohydrate that was black and silver uh, is, gets deposited as an oxidized product. So you are seeing silver. So what it does basically, it is staining the same thing, but it is a different color. And if there is anything extra, like if I see immune deposits, I will have a hard time on picking that up on the PA stain, but silver is not going to stain that area. It will stain the messenger matrix so dark black. If I end up seeing a uh, immune deposit here, the silver will be poor. I will call that area as poorly argyrophilic. That's why that silver stain is the same. So both are staining the same areas, but the morphology is different and the information is different, okay? So when I'm looking at a mesangium on the light microscopy, I'm also judging that matrix expansion is secondary to what? What is causing that expansion? If that expansion is because of something which end up depositing within that gland, silver is not going to stay in that area because silver is staining that original matrix, right? Carbohydrate, but you are now talking about immune complex deposits. Silver is not going to stain that. A classical example in practical life is like a fibrillary or any immune deposit like fibrillary is going to be very poorly argyrophilic. It is not going to stain that. So that's why when I'm looking at a silver stain, I'm appreciating the GBM and I'm also appreciating the mesangium and the darkly stained mesangium is a comforting sign for me that most likely I'm not dealing with any deposits. And all the modalities, though they are alone, you will end up finding information. Like suppose on the light microscopy, I ended up picking up the GBM was thick. I'm seeing vacuoles over here. I'm seeing spikes over here. I will immediately go to my immunofluorescence or 
and see whether the immunofluorescence has any deposits or not, okay? So now, one of the other stains which we use on light microscopy is the trichrome stain, and it is blue. That is how you will know it. HE was pink, PAS was more pink, silver was black, trichrome will be blue. It's a combination of blue and red and different shades of red, basically. These are the red blood cells, the redness is different. This is the cytoplasm, the redness is different. And in the interstitium, this is totally blue. That's why you will know this is trichrome. As I said, I'm showing you the normal. The tubules are back to back. If there was an abnormality, tubules would have been separated from each other, like here. Tubules are separated from each other. They are not back to back. The lumen are still clean. And I can see the glands beautifully. So on the trichrome stain, normally you don't see a lot in the normal morphology, but if it was an abnormal case, if I, there are immune complex deposits, if there's a fibrin, if there's a crescent, I will be appreciate those things very well on the trichrome stain. So trichrome stain you be used to assess fibrosis. So basically what I'm doing on a trichrome stain, I'm seeing how much area of a kidney is replaced by this blue stuff. And I will calculate that as a percentage and I will give you a sense of fibrosis, okay? So this is the trichrome stain in the low power. And you assess the extent of fibrosis. And this is again, normal. Shree, there's a couple questions about the, the uh, red material within the tubules. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So whenever you perform a biopsy, right? That is that you are going into a live patient. So some hemorrhage will occur. So in this biopsy, if I look at the side, this one. See, these are the red blood cells and this is a perfectly like, when we use a needle, it's a true cut needle, right? So it cut the tissue, the blood vessels around that tissue also showed you hemorrhage. So it's possible some of the RBCs which are seeing outside, they are also coming within the tubules. So the red material within the tubules is red blood cells. And you can see that right here, there are a ton of red blood cells over here. But red thing, within the tubule always is not equal to red blood cells. There can be multiple things. So when we will go over acute tubular injury with different kinds of casts, we will teach you that. But right now, in a normal case, ideally tube should be empty. There should not be anything in a normal scenario. But even in a normal scenario, you can see some red blood cells because of the procedure of hemorrhage, okay? Any other questions, Samira? Uh, no. Then we can move on to TIFF. TIFF is going to cover normal immunofluorescence and electron microscopy. So I want a couple questions about the trichrome um, yeah. just coming in now. Sure. Um, how, does, how do you um, assess the extent of fibrosis? Do you just kind of estimate it or do you have a particular way of knowing how to um, label something as mild, moderate, or severe? Yeah. So yes, we estimate it visually. <clears throat> so what I will do, I will go on the lowest power. Okay, and then I will see what is the percentage of the blue area as compared to the entire biopsy. Okay, so this blue area, what is the percentage of this area as compared to the rest of the biopsy? And this is visual estimate, but we have guidelines. If that blue area is less than 25%, I will call that as a mild tubular interstitial scarring. If it is between 26 to 50, I will call that as a moderate. If it is more than 50, I will call that as a severe scarring. And most of the pathologists, we end up agreeing like pretty well if that, that's why that broad guideline is there. So we might not agree on 10 and 20. Some, some 10 for me might be 20 for you, right? So that is a huge variability, but we categorize those categories, less than 25 might, 26 to 50 moderate, more than 50 is severe. And trichrome is not the only stain which, will you, which you are going to use to assess fibrosis the sense of architecture you're also going to get when you will use other stains like silver, PAS, because interstitial edema also will look very blue to you on a trichrome stain. So in practical life, you will end up using other stains when you will come up with that percentage, when you give that final count or that number. Uh, there was a question about the di differentiating edema and fibrosis on trichrome. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. Show, show, is, you have an example of what- Yeah, so let me show you an example. Basically, edema is something, that's why the beauty of stains, man. I love different stains in pathology. So can you appreciate this blueness? If I say this is blue, is it looking blue to you? Can you appreciate this edema? 
This is blue. Can you appreciate that blue? It's kind of a bluish uh, yes. gray. Yeah, that is bluish gray, right? So for us, that is edema, interstitial edema. And, so and that this, is. And, and the, the stain that you had there, can you reiterate? HNE. That? This is the HNE stain. And you can appreciate the interstitial edema very nicely on an HNE stain. And how, how does that look on trichrome then? Yeah, so let me find. And trichrome is also going to look blue. So in that, if I take that area, so for. You cannot differentiate between edema and fibrosis on a trichrome stain. Trichrome, like this was a trichrome stain. You will end up saying, oh, that is all fibrosis, right? But you looked at the h &E, you identified the morphology that was very bluish. That's why you said it was edema, not fibrosis. The blueness, which we just saw, is not going to be present in a well fibrotic area. Blue is interstitial edema. More interstitial edema, you will see more blueness. And if in a well-defined fibrotic area, that blueness will be gone. Okay, great. Um, I think we can move on. I'm sure, did you want to do any of the polling questions or should we save that for- We can move on. Step? Yeah, we can save for later on. We can move on to TIFF, yeah. Okay, great. Um, can you, um, you want to introduce Dr. Kaza? Tiffany, uh, Tiffany is one of the renal pathologists who works here and she is a great pathologist. She will go over immunofluorescence and electron microscopy um, findings with you in a normal case scenario. Tiff, can you share the screen? So Tiff, yeah, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna continue where Dr. Sharma left off on some immunofluorescence and electron microscopy. So we use a standard immunofluorescence panel on all kidney biopsies, and this includes both native and allograft biopsies. And the routine stains that we do are IgA, IgG, IgM, C3, C1Q, kappa, and lambda light chains. Depending on the pattern within glomeruli, which renal compartments are affected, and what's the character of the staining, you can distinguish one of many immune complex mediated diseases. And so here, there is a bunch of conditions through which there may be staining, some of which stain for multiple immune reactants and some of which are specific for one or a few immune reactants. I'm not gonna go through all of these diseases, but just in general, what the pattern of staining looks like and give some insights of um, why we do some of the extra studies that we might do on kidney biopsy. And so looking at the distribution of deposits within the renal compartments is important. You can have staining within glomeruli. And so here we have some granular mesangial and capillary loop staining, as well as you can see some tubular epithelial cell nuclei um, staining. And so, which is actually a tissue ANA pattern. Additionally, in the tubular interstitium, you can see tubular basement membrane deposits, uh, pure or which are fine and granular, or vascular immune deposits. The distribution of deposits within a single glomerulus is important as well. And so um, the mesangium anchoring the capillary loops, as Dr. Sharma was describing, is a mesangial pattern. And so you don't see staining um, connecting a capillary loop, but the skeleton thereof. Capillary loop staining can be either due to subendothelial or subepithelial deposits. Subendothelial deposits tend to have smooth contours, while subepithelial deposits tend to be granular. However, if these deposits become confluent, they can look like these subendothelial deposits, and there's when electron microscopy can be very useful. The character of amine deposits is also important. And so here is granular global capillary loop staining. And so in a case of membranous glomerulopathy, this highlights the glomerular basement membranes in a linear fashion and linear staining is seen in anti-GBM disease. And then this is a smudgy pattern of staining, kind of like a child took a crayon and incompletely colored the glomerulus. And it can go along the capillary loops as well this is seen in fibrillary glomerulopathy, but can also be seen in amyloid when it's restricted to one light chain in AL amyloidosis. 
Kaplan Lambda light chain scanning allow us to determine if immune deposits are monotypic and are used in the evaluation of monoclonal gammopathies of renal significance. These are granular mesangial staining that's restricted for kappa, and there's no corresponding staining for lambda light chain. And this is a case of uh, proliferative glomerulonephritis with monoclonal IgG deposits, could, but could be seen in other conditions as well. Here is granular capillary loop staining of a membranous glomerulopathy um, that is restricted for kappa and not lambda light chain, um, seen in a monotypic membranous glomerulopathy. Um, of course, you can have lambda restricted deposits as well, although these two examples were kappa. You also evaluate for monoclonality in the other immune compartments or other renal compartments. So here is tubular basement membrane Bowman's capsule and glomerular capillary loop staining for kappa and not highlighted by lambda light chain. And this is a case of light chain deposition disease. Vessels will also show accentuating a staining, although um, not highlighted well in this image. You can look at the proximal tubular protein resorption droplets. When they restrict for one light chain, this is seen in a light chain proximal tubulopathy. We look for a two plus difference in immune reactants to consider them restricted. So we can see very bright lambda light chain, but only some trace kappa light chain staining. We use a trace to three plus system when we evaluate staining while trace is barely detectable immune deposits. 1 plus is mild, 2 plus is moderately bright, and 3 plus is um, very bright. And we use intratubular uh, casts. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so one thing I've always wondered about this, um, the pathologists always show us one image. Um, and uh, how, how and do you look at a whole area um, are you looking at this under the scope or do you take a picture and then look at it? Uh, and, and what if uh, you have to restain if it's sort of borderline ever? Can you can you explain, you know, because it seems very subjective. Yes, honestly, it is a bit subjective, but what we use as a control um, for staining is intratubular cast. That's what we would consider three plus staining. So if you um, dial down the intensity of the immunofluorescence so that the brightest thing in the field is your intratubular cast, that can serve as an internal reference for staining. So you're doing we this under the, under the scope um, and looking at the slide. You're not doing this after taking the picture like you're showing us now. This is just a demonstration with the picture. Okay, I don't have a slide where I can do that now. So um, because... As a pathologist, how do you do it? That's what oh, sure. Um, when you're looking at it, are you looking at it live underneath the scope in the slide? Or how, how does that happen? Or someone taking a photo of it and showing it to us like this? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, um, Matt, we do it live. Uh, have, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Yeah. Okay. We have an internal control on every case, which is our albumin stain, and that will highlight the tubular basement membranes as well as the glomeruli. And that is what we would consider our negative. And then we use intratubular casts as our three plus positive. So grading immune reactants is everything that's in between that. And these are representative pictures, man. When we do it, we do it live. So problem with immunofluorescence is that it will quench very fast. The fluorescence is going to go away. So what we do when we look at it, we select a representative field and catch an image right there so that we can save it for permanence because if you look at it for a while the extent or the intensity of immunofluorescence is going to diminish so what tiffany is going to show you is showing you the different images they are just representative images of the entire slide so for most of these just for reference i'm giving three plus examples to show you know very bright staining and not what we would um, consider more gray zone cases. So IgG subclass staining can be used to determine whether 
deposits are monotypic or monoclonal. When you have kappa or lambda light chain restriction, those deposits are monotypic or of one immunoglobulin uh, light chain type. But if you do IgG subclasses, if IgG deposits are present and they're restricted to one subclass, these deposits may be monoclonal. Um, you potentially can have um, more than one clone and be of the same subclass, um, but it's more concerning when you have subclass restrictions to be dealing with a monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. So this is the same case as shown earlier. Um, that showed kappa light chain restriction. And when doing immunoglobulin subclasses, there is staining for IgG3, but not IgG1, IgG2, and IgG4. And it's important to take these images of the same fluorescence intensity uh, when comparing them. And so the deposits were not only monotypic, but are likely monoclonal. You can see a full- well, Before you move on, can I, I just question about it's a little bit unrelated to the actual stains here, um, but uh, when they send a, a pathology specimen to you, um, how do you, is it a fresh specimen for the immunofluorescence or is it in some um, material to uh, preserve it? How, how is the, this, the biopsy specimen sent to you and then when you stain it for immunofluorescence? Okay, honestly, I'm having a little difficulty hearing the questions, but the immunofluorescence is done on fresh frozen tissue, the tissue that we receive in um, Michelle's preservative. And the antibodies that we use are direct conjugates to FITC, um, and they're polyclonal antibodies, so they should pick up multiple epitopes. Okay, thank you. And so. A full house pattern of immune complex deposition includes all three immunoglobulin heavy chains, so IgA, IgG, and IgM, as well as both complement components, C3 of the alternative complement pathway and C1Q of the classical complement pathway. This is typically seen in lupus nephritis, but other lupus-like conditions can cause this pattern, including HIV immune complex disease of the kidney, medications, especially those that are implicated in drug-induced lupus, viral hepatitis, and it can be an incidental finding in renal algrafts grafts without proliferation. You may see a C1Q dominant full house immune deposits. Fibrinogen staining can highlight fibrinoid necrosis. And so we see a break in the glomerular capillary tuft and highlighting by fibrinogen. And this is seen when you have necrotizing crescents. And from the same biopsy, here's a cellular crescent on Jones stain and highlighting that GBM break. You can also see fibrinogen staining within vessels in a necrotizing arteritis or within granulomas within interstitium in a um, necrotizing granulomatous inflammation that you might see in mycobacterial or fungal infections. There's multiple immunohistochemical stains that we can utilize on renal biopsies. And most of them, these are not gonna be used on routine cases, but may help us in obtaining a final diagnosis within some cases. Those that are more commonly used in renal allografts are SP40 to look for polyomavirus infection, CMV, adenovirus, AFB, and GMS to look for infections within immunocompromised patients. C4D indicates endothelial injury and antibody-mediated rejection. We use numerous stains to subtype membranous glomerulopathy, um, as the causative antigens are known in some cases. When you have lymphoid infiltrates in the biopsy, using different immunohistochemical stains can help us determine whether they're reactive or if it could represent a neoplastic process like a lymphoma where we need to be worried about it. Within intratubular casts, we can use myoglobin and hemoglobin to see if the patient may have systemic hemolysis or rhabdomyolysis. Sometimes a typical cast could also be stained with kappa or lambda light chains by paraffin immunofluorescence um, to evaluate for a light chain cast nephropathy. There are some um, specific markers for um, immune complex related kidney diseases that are helping in nailing down the diagnosis 
One is DNA JB9, which is specific for fibrillary glomerulopathy. Another is serum amyloid P, which is, um, helps us determine a diagnosis of membranous glomerulopathy with monoclonal IgG kappa deposits. And lysozyme and tamhorsal protein can help us in evaluating etiologies of tubular injury. These two stains are a little difficult to read and I'm not gonna show them today. I just want to make a general comment about um, those stains. Um, obviously, not every biopsy will have every stain done, so it's really important to provide comprehensive history to the pathologist so that they can use these stains when they're necessary um, outside of what may be a part of the protocol. And um, since I'm a transplant nephrologist, there's a comment about SV40. SV stands for simian virus, so a way to remember that is that BK is, is a type of simian virus, and so we use SV40 which I think is on the next slide, to look for presence of either BK or JC virus in the um, sample. Yeah, thank you for that, Samira. And I'm not going to show um, all of these stains for the sake of time, and some of them are more isoteric, but we'll show the ones that are more frequently um, utilized. So. Um, SV40, as Dr. Farouk was just mentioning, um, can be seen with both BK or JC nephritis. And in advanced cases, you can see changes in the tubular epithelial cell nuclei that can have a glassy appearance. They can be enlarged, as you can see, compared to um, tubular nuclei near them, and they can have prominent nucleoli. However, this is a very advanced case, and in the majority of cases, there are few nuclei that may be positive. And in these cases, it's very important to use an SV40 stain to um, highlight positive cells. And we use SV40 on all renal allografts uh, and recommend this as it can be difficult to detect cytopathic effects. And this is a late change that could be detected earlier with an SV40 stain. CMV highlights CMV nephritis. This is, again, is a very advanced case in which you see an owl eye intranuclear inclusion um, and significant cytopathic effects. Be sure to tell us what stain that is you're looking at. Absolutely. So this is a CMV stain. You'll see nuclear. The other um, side. Staining. Is it oh, an H&E This, one. PA this is an H&E. Thank you. Sorry about that. So here's another H&E stain, and you see granulomatous inflammation. So these are epithelioid histiocytes, and they're surrounded by another layer. And we sometimes call this the hot dog sign because it's granuloma surrounded by more granuloma. Um, this is seen in advanced cases of adenovirus infection. However, um, this is a very late example. And in earlier examples, you can see some punctate staining within tubular epithelial cell nuclei. Maybe I'm missing it, but I, I don't see the hot dog. Maybe it says close to lunch, but what? where's the hot dog? Can you show us what like the bun is, I guess, on the biopsy with the mouse? I'm sorry, where what is? Can you outline the hot dog for us? Like, where are the components of the hot dog? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can see this granuloma and it's surrounded um, by more granulomatous inflammation. And you, so you have an inner layer plus an outer layer. So we sometimes call this the hot dog sign, which is adenoviral infection. And patients tend to have significant pyuria associated with this. So other stains you can use for granulomatous inflammation include AFB or acid fast bacilli, and this stains mycobacteria. This is a severe example, usually you only see a few, and they're curvilinear magenta rods. And Grocon's methamine silverstein um, highlights fungi. These can be seen on a Jones stain as well, as well as a PAS stain, but you have so much background staining as well that it can be distracting that sometimes it's easier to use a GMS to highlight these microorganisms. C4D is very useful and should be done in all renal allografts, and this indicates endothelial injury due to antibody-mediated rejection. Significant staining is within peritubular capillaries, and this can be done by either aminofluorescence 
or by immunohistochemistry. There will always be staining within glomerular mesangium and that can serve as a positive control internally in your biopsy. Membranous glomerulopathy can be subtyped and some membranous antigens can be monitored non-invasively in serum and this is the usefulness of subtyping. A negative pattern is only in podocytes and you don't see staining along capillary loops. And a positive pattern is granular staining along the capillary loops. And so this is true for PLA2R and THSD7A. There are other new antigens, including exostosin, nerve epidermal growth factor like one, and semaphorin 3B, which is a very new antigen described um, in the, by the Mayo Clinic earlier this month. Um, and so these are some stains that are used to subtype membranous cases. Fibrillary glomerulopathy, so you can see the smudgy staining that we looked at earlier, um, can be highlighted by a DNA JB9 stain. This is highly sensitive and specific for fibrillary and we don't see it in any other immune complex mediated diseases. Um, so it's a great stain to confirm the diagnosis. And then membranous-like glomerulopathy with mass monoclonal IgG kappa deposits. This is a fairly esoteric disease, but you see a membranous-like pattern by aminofluorescent stain, so granular capillary loop and mesangial staining. And serum amyloid P um, is important in confirming this diagnosis. Um, serum amyloid P is not seen in any other immune complex mediated diseases. However, it is a component of amyloid, but that would have a different pattern of staining. It would be there, more smudgy that, like fibrillary. There is a question about going back to the DNA JB9. Is that a cytoplasmic or a vasomembrane stain? A cytoplasmic. And it should be throughout the glomerular mesangium, although in some cases you do have segmental staining. Thanks. So stains to evaluate CAS. Um, we have hemoglobin and myoglobin. The CAS, um, so this is a PAS stain. Um, they're granular and they can have a beaded appearance and they stain positively for hemoglobin or myoglobin. Occasionally, similar morphology casts can be seen in light chain deposition disease. So this is a con th that's a, a pitfall of staining, and sometimes paraffin kappa and lambda are needed in these cases as well. These morphologically look identical for hemoglobin and myoglobin, and often we need to do both. Um, what is the what is the stain uh, on the IHC there, right there on the right? So the stain on the IHC here is hemoglobin. Oh, but myoglobin will look identical both um, by light microscopy as well as immunohistochemistry. So we do both when we have this morphology. For that, yeah, so you'd, you'll do a separate stain for both hemoglobin and myoglobin. Yeah. Sometimes in cases where we have known rhabdomyolysis, we'll just do myoglobin, but often it's important to do both because the morphology is the same. And is that, you're, you're, um, sorry, Matt, go ahead. Oh, is that the, uh, is that a tubule that's going up to that glom that's filled with it? Or what is that? Or is that a blood vessel? So since this is a hemoglobin stain, yeah, within the glom, there's a few red blood cells that no, are no, coming towards it, uh, pointing towards it. The long structure going towards the glom. This one here? No, next to that elongated one pointed towards the glom? Right, right here? Yes. Um, so this is a hemoglobin positive cast. So it's picking up this eosinophilic granular material. That's in a the tubule. Cast. So I was gonna move on to some electron microscopy and this is just an image for orientation. Um, so we have Bowman's capsule, Bowman's space, the podocytes, and the podocytes interdigitate and make podocyte foot processes. And this is along the subepithelial surface of the glomerular capillary loop. The subendothelial surface is on the other side. And you have endothelial cells present along the subendothelial surface. 
Connecting the glomerular capillary loops are mesangial areas. So you have mesangial matrix as well as mesangial cells. And you look at deposits within all of these compartments as well as abnormalities um, within the glomerular basement membranes and mesangium. So I'll, I'll give a, a few examples. So, so when, Tip, I'm gonna actually ask you to go back and stay on that slide for a second. And I think just for, time, just for time, I think we should start to wrap things up. Um, and maybe we can continue this in the subsequent session because we're uh, past 12 right now. Um, so just gonna give the participants that are here um, another opportunity to ask any questions based on what we've shown so far today. So basics of light microscopy, some review of aminofluorescence and immunohistochemistry. And here we have a, a normal electron microscopy, which maybe we can spend some more time on. Um, so while people are putting their questions in, um, if you can go back to the uh, myoglobin, hemoglobin, IHC, there was a question about what is that round structure in the center? This one? Correct. Uh, that's an intratubular hemoglobin cast. So that's a tubule. This is a tubule, yeah. And these are distal tubules. Um, so the proximal tubules have this faint staining in the cytoplasm, but distal tubules, um, we have uh, hematoxylin is our counter stain, um, but it's not being highlighted like you have uh, basement membranes highlighted by PAS. Awesome. Um, and in the last few minutes, um, Dr. Sharma, I was wondering if you could take us back to your microscope. There were some additional questions about the normal um, features of the light microscopy. So if we can switch the screens back over. And so for those of you who had any lingering questions about the light microscopy, H&E or PAS stain, please share them in the chat now. And so we can have Dr. Sharma kind of review some of those. Um, well, a few questions that had come up after we switched were, can you um, talk a little bit more about identification of the paratubular capillaries and show us some examples of those? Oh, wow. we got some fluorescence. Very cool. little treat. <laughs> this treat. is the live view oh, of a microscope. I've been waiting for this live view of uh, fluorescence. Thank you. You're most welcome. So see, when we look at the immunofluorescence slide, we look at everything like, like what we did on the light. I will look at the glomerulus, I will look at the proximal tubules, and I will look at basement membranes, like all the compartments which we discussed. I'm going to do the same thing even on the IA. And then when I go on high power, I can play with that and see how, as I went on the high power, the intensity changed, so I have to decrease the exposure time. I have to play with that because this is, and now you can see that granularity in a nice way. So this is membranous and you can see the granularity. When I say granular, I mean the dot dot, which you can see the dots, small dots, and this is a membranous, beautiful membranous. You can see the small dots, which are separated by each other. This is what we mean by granular, global, glomerular capillary wall deposits, and this is membranous, okay? So now I will put our <clears throat> light microscopy slides and I will answer the questions which were asked. I will go automatic, switch the microscope, turn on the light, and boom, we are in the light microscopy zone. So you can use the same microscope. So I switched in between the light microscopy and immunofluorescence because I have that attachment. So I ended up switching in between two microscopes. Like, so now the question was, where are the peritubular capillaries? Can you show us again? <clears throat> so what I'm doing, I'm looking. So the location for the peritubular capillaries by definition is in between the tubules, okay? So now I know this is the tubule, this is the tubule, this round structure in between, which was not having any epithelial lining is the peritubular capillary. This is the peritubular capillary. This is the peritubular capillary. And we will show you transplant cases <clears throat> where the evaluation of peritubular capillaries are very important. And we will go over that again in the, when we deal with transplants. Any more questions, Samira? Um, no, uh, maybe also if you can review again how we can distinguish between the different types of tubules. Just a lot of questions about different tubules and different types of blood vessels and how do you tell the difference? Definitely. <clears throat> so on the light, uh, this power itself, 
I can see a lot of cytoplasm over here in this tibule. That's why this is a proximal tibule, okay? So we will go from tibule to tibule, okay? So this tibule has got a lot of cytoplasm. It has proximal tubular breast border. That's why it's a proximal tibule. When I look at this tibules, they don't have that. They don't have that ample cytoplasm, which I see. They don't have the brush border. So these are the distal tibules. And this round structures in between, they don't have the, even the lining epithelium. So that's why they are the peritubular capillaries. And I just have to go tubule to tubule to make up my mind. Anything which looks like that is a proximal tibule. Anything which will look like that will be a distal tibule. You know? So it will be just morphology comparison. And the diseases, we will, when we will deal with diseases, we will go over the morphology in more details, like the diseases which are going to affect proximal tibioles, what is going to be the morphology in that scenario. So in this field itself, these are all proximal tibioles. You can see distal tibioles, and you can see peritubular capillaries. Yeah. Thank you. That was that was great. So thank you to our presenters, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kaza. Um, we will have this session available on the YouTube channel that we shared um, later this afternoon. And uh, looking forward to our next session um, sometime next month. Um, so please feel free to share with us any feedback about these sessions um, to email any of us. Uh, you can also get in touch with us via social media. Um, Arcana Labs has its own Twitter account as well. Um, and we will see you next time. I uh, hope everyone has a safe and uh, relaxing weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye-bye.